A United Nations report exposes a secret program to provide repentant terrorists with a means of livelihood. And Pan Yoruba Social Political Organization Afeni Fair warns that Nigeria may be drifting towards a tyrannical state. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cohn. A United Nations publication has detailed a secret government program tagged Sulu, designed to pull commanders of terrorist groups, including Boko Haram and the Islamic State for West Africa province, ISWAB, out of the forest, rehabilitate them and provide them a means of livelihood. Now, the development comes as an intelligence agency uh, began investigation into the recent surrender of over 1,200 terrorists and their families in the last three weeks. According to the report, the investigation seeks to ascertain whether the surrender was genuine or a ploy to activate and coordinate terror sleeper cells across the country. Now, security officials believe Sulu could open a door to a peace deal, ending a conflict that is now in, in its 12th year. But critics argue that such a deal would reward mass killers. Anyways, joining us to discuss this is Dixon Osage and Efe Wanago, both of them security experts. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. All right. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Dixon, because you're here in the studio, and I'm, I'm going to toss to Efe. Um, but... The first question that comes to everybody's mind is, are we trying to reward bad behavior here? Oh, sure. We're trying to reward bad behavior. Yeah, we're trying to reward, reward bad behavior. Uh, in the sense that uh, most of these unnecessary human beings uh, are needed to pass through a procedure. Uh, that is the reason why I think uh, uh, the administration of criminal justice system has been defeated. Uh, because uh, the state governors or the government uh, doesn't have that power to, at their own will, Pardon, uh, terrorists. We're talking about terrorists here who have decimated a lot of human beings. You know, uh, if you go to most of our barracks now, uh, we have uh, one of the largest. Uh, uh, we have the most uh, populous uh, 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 widows. You know, uh, in our barracks. You know, our barracks uh, accommodates more of widows. You know, who lost their husbands in the battlefield, and uh, some of them amputated. Uh, last week, I was at. Uh, Ojo Cantonment uh, to celebrate with my classmates. We just marked our 23rd anniversary in the military. So I went to so, uh, pay them a visit and I saw some of them uh, amputated, legs amputated, hands gone. And I felt so bad that if uh, our government uh, will have to tread on this path, you know, in pardoning this uh, criminal element without letting them pass through uh, the administration of criminal justice system. The administration of criminal justice system uh, comprises of the police, the court, and the prison. And the police uh, needs to, you know, uh, prepare the charges against these guys. Uh, you know, uh, uh, then the court needs to, you know, convict them. Then they let them go and pay uh, the price for uh, their offenses. But if we have them reintegrated into the society, uh, definitely uh, we you, you can don't trust a terrorist. You understand? You uh, you and I saw what transpired in Afghanistan. It took Americans 20 years to build Afghanistan, and uh, it took the Taliban 11 days. Uh, to take over Afghanistan. Uh, if you trust terrorists, you, you're going to be in danger. And some of these guys, if they are being reintegrated into the uh, society, uh, nobody knows uh, their uh, next plan of action. And if Nigerian government are not careful, uh, they might be creating more dangers ahead of this great nation. Hmm. F.A., um, could it be that the federal government knows, you know, that this is a great way to end insurgency or terrorism in the country, and that's why they're taking this route. Do, do you think that maybe um, they've done due diligence and they feel that this is the best way to deal with it? Ife, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, I do not have um, the information at their disposal, but uh, whatever may be the reason, the time, the motivation for kind of action. Clearly, it's a no-no for me because, uh, like your guest in the studio, Dixon has posited, I want to align myself entirely with him. You don't um, appease criminals. You know, people, and moreover, refer to the DJ report, the UN report, it's a clandestine program. It's not out there in the open. Mm. So there is nothing to give it credibility in the manner of speaking. And it is not as though you have been able to box 
the criminals, the terrorists into a corner, and then they have nowhere to go. They have been taken as prisoners, and then you have not gone through rehabilitation processes, and you want to reintegrate them. What we are doing, basically, is to appease criminals and to create an incentive for other would-be criminals to take to criminality. Persons who have killed Nigerians, who continue to kill members of the military and ordinary Nigerians, have been rewarded program to whatever if I've had pro problems from the uh, if I think we're, we're having connection issues. In different case. They did not engage in mass killing of Nigeria, they did not engage in killing the military. Mm. Um, I'm sorry, I think we're having connection issues, um, so we couldn't hear some of the things that you said, but I'll come back to you, Efe. Um, Dick Olayoko is a, a journalist, and he, he's joining us also via Zoom. Um, Mr. Olayoko, what about addressing the issues that brought about this insurgency in the first instance, the reasons why we are um, facing the kind of terrorism that we're facing today in, in Nigeria? Wouldn't that be a better way to deal with, you know, this insurgency than, you know, going about this rehabilitation process? Sorry, I, I didn't get the beginning of that question. So I'm saying, um, what about addressing the issues that brought about the insurgency? Lack of education, infrastructure, lack of infrastructure, poverty, unemployment... What if those things were addressed? Would that not be a better way of dealing with the problem? I mean, going to the root cause instead of um, trying to somewhat rehabilitate these terrorists. Yes, if we are looking at the issue of uh, Boko Haram, I think that is the one we are talking, that is the focus now. Because we are talking about repentant terrorists, I think this is a fallout of the news uh, that we have been getting in the past two weeks when the uh, Boko Haram guys are said to be surrendering in their thousands. I think that needs for you to understand that the case of the Boko Haram is like a case of uh, religious extremism. So I, I think the best thing to do, which I think the government is already in, is a process or a program they call the radicalization of these guys. Because it is the teaching that is uh, propelling some of the people to join them and then that is propelling them to go into this act of terrorism. But I, I, I think that is not something that will, that will take care of those people that are already in the field. I, I think it is the radicalization and then changing the modus, the, the method of uh, preaching, which I think the government started some six or seven years back, checking the type of uh, preaching and teaching that some of these uh, clerics teach to their followers. Because if you look at Boko Haram, if you look at the Uyghur teaching, it is the extreme by some of them. Um, seem the local head with them, and that is why the Boko Haram guys believe that they are the authentic ones because they are to the extreme. So anything short of their own belief to them is a uh, is a capari. Hello, Mr. Layaku. When you say that de-radicalization would be the solution, I, I'd like to take you back to the fact that these people there. The, there's been a set that was so-called de-radicalized. And we hear from the same Nigerian army that some of these people went back and became informants uh, and moles for Boko Haram. So, really, I ask my question that, again. That, that, Should that, we not be addressing the this. root cause of the problem instead of trying to put a plaster on the cancer? No, no, that's why I said it's a two-pronged approach. Why you are trying to radicalize the people that are already in the field, that are already have been brainwashed into believing what Boko Haram preaches. There is a need for the government, which I think they are doing, to take a second look or critical look at the, motive, the type of preaching that is being dished out. That's what I said. That be and listen to some clerics. You want that the type of teaching they are giving out, which to some extent has given rise to this extremism. Religion should be a matter of moderation. But when it is not only in the Islam world that most things that you have extremism. So I, I think while the government is trying to de radicalize those people that are already there, that have been captured into the fold, I, I think what the government should also do, which I think they are doing, and they should say more, more, more attention to it, is the type of preaching that gave rise to the Boko Haram in the, in, the, in, the, in the Islamic schools, in the mosques. There's the need for government to regulate, so to speak, like the director should do what they say, or to moderate, so that people that are teaching religion in the churches, in the mosque especially, don't give rise to the kind of teaching 
that these Boko Haram guys have been praised. Because if you listen to them, for example, we are looking at Taliban's that have taken over in Afghanistan now. They are Muslims. But there are other Muslims that believe that they are to be extreme. So I, I think the government has a lot of work to do, and that is where the NOA comes into place. That is National Education Agency. This, this is the area where the, I think they should be uh, doing more. Sorry, I, I think uh, something just happened to my lips. Okay. Um, Dixon, back to you. Is this a quick fix? Because he's saying the government probably is going in the right direction and de-radicalization de can work. But it, the fact that it's, it's been shrouded in so much secrecy, doesn't it call to question how government is going about it and the army? Um, you say if it's a quick fix? I, I, I think, yes, it's a quick, a terrible fix, you know, um, and it's going to be detrimental to the survival of Nigeria. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that um, ideological driven war, driven war uh, is different from other um, um, driven war, just like uh, what transpired in the Niger Delta and some other part of the world. This ideological driven war uh, is a war that perhaps could take till eternity. Uh, you can't tell somebody, for example, I'm a Christian, uh, there's nothing you're going to tell me about Jesus Christ today or, or the opposite side of Jesus that I will believe because that is my faith. I understand. And most of these guys, they have been brainwashed uh, in the sense that uh, they believe that um, when they take out an infidel, uh, they have a place in heaven uh, you know, uh, kept for them. And that is why, like the last speaker rightly said, uh, we need to start looking into religious brutality uh, because sometimes we always believe that in our climb here, we're suffering from police brutality. Police brutality is the least problem we have here in Nigeria. Uh, we need to look into police uh, uh, religious brutality. We also need to look into uh, psychological and ethnocentric brutality, you know, tribal brutality because Nigeria, look Looking at the ethnography of Nigeria, uh, Nigeria is a massive nation and uh, the diversity of our tongues is also a natural uh, problem itself. So for me, I, I would advise the, very, the federal government to be very, very careful uh, because uh, you can't trust a terrorist, you can't trust a killer. If somebody can go to that extent to eliminate human lives and you think you can bring it back to the society, then they must go to all the prison in Nigeria and release all the criminals. Those ones that stole Maggi, those ones that stole Pepe and salt, let them go and release everybody in prison because I don't think this is a good way uh, or a good notion. And that is why uh, the spread of insecurity sprang up because sometime last two years, I advised the Castina state governor are to be very careful about negotiation because you don't negotiate with the enemy. And if you must negotiate with the enemy, uh, you must negotiate from the side of strength and not on the side of weakness. When you sit on the side of weakness and negotiate with your enemy, uh, your survivor will be very, very, uh, will, be, will be at risk. Uh, that is why uh, uh, banditry sprang up in the Southwest because of these negotiation skills. And these kidnappers, they believe that, hey, uh, you can make money by uh, illegally transporting our people. And you can see from the Southwest in the past, uh, from the south uh, northwest in the past two, three months now, uh, the illegal uh, exportation or transportation of our, our students in school is becoming worrisome. Nigeria is a treaty, it's a signatory uh, to the Safe School Declaration in uh, Oslo, Norway, 2015. And we are not abiding by that Safe School Declaration in protecting our children from the hands of this unnecessary human being or criminal uh, elements. So for me, what I want the federal government to do, they must be very careful uh, not to certify crime because certifying crime is, you know, uh, believing that those that commit this uh, crime, uh, they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they should be forgiven. Oh yes, I'm not against uh, them surrendering, but surrendering could be deceptive. I'm a trained soldier. For the fact that somebody surrender in the battlefield, you need to analyze the reason why he surrender uh, in the battlefield. Perhaps uh, the high-powered fire, the Tucano bombardment, the Air Force bombardment, the artillery bombardment, the armor bombardment uh, is too you know, heavy for them to contain and they all come out to surrender. You have to understand that that surrendering was based on high firepower. But if that surrendering is of true conscience and they believe that what they are doing against the Nigerian state uh, is really erroneous, then we can take that surrender as a true surrender. Surrender could be deceptive. And let us not uh, jubilate or rejoice over them surrendering because surrender could be deceptive and it could be a uh, formation in which they need to fall back, you know, have a plan B and strike uh, the government again. So if the government thinks they want to continue to negotiate these guys, I am telling you that the government are certifying crime and that tells you people from all parts of Africa will have to come into Nigeria because they will believe that Nigeria is a prone environment where people can commit crime and go scot free. And we also need to we have a lot to do, uh, Mary Ann. We need to go into uh, 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 the effectiveness of our administration of criminal justice system. Uh, you know, when you commit a crime, you need to be punished. Punishment is very essential. You know, if you don't punish people for what they do, our uh, crime will continue to flourish from the east, west, south, and north. But the government, if truly the report from the uh, United uh, Nations is true, uh, it's going to be a shame, and they must return our two back to America and 
collect back our change because we expected that Tucano to come and perform wonders. Tucano is built to well, contain but, with but, 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 but I mean, I'm going to come back to that because that's a, that's a case on its own. And, and, the Senate, uh, and the senators who sat on that, who put a pause on it, have their reasons. We'll come back to that. But I'm back to you, Efe. I hope you can hear me. Um, security officials, according to this UN report, um, believe that this, this um, strategy, this Sulham strategy of theirs um, could open the door to a peace deal and, uh, you know, and end this stalemated war, this guerrilla warfare that has been on, um, you know, for more than a decade. So I'm wondering to myself, um, do you think, Efe, that this is the way to go? Oh, I think we lost a face. So let me, let me go to you, Mr. Mr. Layoko. Um, the same question. Security operatives, our own security officials, think that this is a great idea. This is the way to go. They think that this will open a door to a peace deal. But I'd also like to put it in there that there are victims. There are people who their family members have been killed, have been missing for years. They've not been able to hear from them. There are people who, feel, who have been targeted also who have been survivors, our soldiers also. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about the senior officials, I'm talking about the men who are in the thick of the warfare, um, also feel that their brothers, their, their comrades have been taken. In considering all of this, I'm thinking to myself, do you support the fact that these officials think that this will open a door to a peace deal? And what do you consider peace in this instance? Yes, there is a need for us to understand that this thing is based on what we are discussing is based on the report, which some of us have not read. We have not heard from the government. But let us assume that that report is correct. All over the world, every war ends as the negotiating table. Every war, no matter how very powerful you are, there is the, at a point in time when everybody realizes that there is no need for the war to continue, that there is no need for us to waste human beings and their human resources and their other resources. Every war ends at the negotiating table. But usually what happens is that government is always, like my brother said, is always negotiating from the point of strength so that government can determine the way the negotiation will go. If you realize that in the past three or four months, the government has really intensified his war against these guys, and perhaps that is why you are seeing them coming out in their thousand to surrender because of the fire fire of the government. But you see, uh, so it, it, there's a need for us not to have uh, short memories of collective amnesia. Nigeria society, it's not only in Nigeria society, I always make, this, uh, make reference to one man they call uh, Jerry Adams. He used to be the leader of the Sinfin, that is the military wing of the IRA. Mm. You know, the half of the IRA, for, uh, the, the, the on, uh, and, uh, in, that, in that time, in the, about 15, 20 years ago. You know, after the, after the peace negotiation, the man ended up as a member of the parliament. So, and again, let us now come, let us come back home. You all will realize that there was a time when we have the terrorism act, also to speak, some people say we cannot compare. Mm -hmm. What was happening in the South South, that the late Wari Mara Mariela, that was the president then, how to negotiate because at the end of the day we had peace. But those are two different, I'm sorry, so I'm sorry, Mr. Layoku, but those are two different things. And I, and I can make an argument. I know that the Niger Delta militants are not here. <laughs> But Where are you waiting? Where are the you waiting amnesty to program yeah. that the Niger Delta militants have okay. yes. is totally different from what the army is serving to terrorists who outrightly kill people because they do not want Western education. I brought, uh, well, my sister, the militants, sister, you, and, and I'm not in any way making a case for the Niger Delta militants, but then you're taking oil from right under them. They do not have healthcare facilities. They do not have access to education. Their waters when, when have been to, destroyed when, by these my, IOCs. So I'm, they're, they're negotiating from a, a standpoint. I'm wondering what ISWAP's position would be asking for amnesty. Help me. You see, the point is in war, there's something they call rule of engagement. The moment somebody comes out from the forest and he say, I'm surrendering, the army cannot do anything. They, have, they cannot open fire on them again. That is the predicament of the Nigerian government now. Because these guys came out, there's a rule of engagement. This guy came out and said, we are surrendering. And like the, from, like the chief of army staff said when he came on, he said to him, he doesn't want to hear that anybody surrender. If you can catch them in the forest, I'll turn them down. But the moment they come out with their hands raised up and say we are surrendering, the rules of engagement said you capture this guy as a prisoner of war. So now the government is faced with a predicament. What do we do? 
You remember what happened so in the if they are prisoners of war, statement. why can't they stay prisoners? Why do you have to give, give them houses, give them a new lease of life when people are still having to live with the consequences of their actions? My dear sister, the moment somebody, the moment somebody comes out, he has become a prisoner of war. There's a way you can treat that person. You see, this thing is not only peculiar to Nigeria. That is the general standard. Once somebody comes and it becomes like a prisoner of war, he is entitled to all the basic things of life. The only thing short of that, the United Nations or whatever the ICC will count will count them guilty, uh, pull them guilty of what they call um, abuse of matter. So the government is a predicament. There is the need what the government should do now because there are some people that joined this Boko Haram not out of their own position. Many of them were conspirated, conspirated into the Boko Haram army by force. It's either they captured them or they captured their wife, their children. So I think what the government needs to do is to profile them. Who are the real commanders? Who are the people who actually went into the war with their eyes open? From people who are from, from people who are coerced to join in. So I think that is what the government should do to profile them to know those who actually perpetrated this act out of their own coalition and not those people who are captured and then compelled to go into this war. So it will be difficult for government to capture about 2,000, 3,000 people and say they want to drag them to court. Many of these guys who joined the Boko Haram because they were forced to join. We have had the state cases of abduction and stuff like that. So I, I think what the government needs to do now, the issue, the issue of capturing everything is has now ended with the military. Everything now boils down to government. This is where government comes in. And let me tell you, the issue of negotiating with Boko Haram didn't start just today. So, because, like I said, it has always been there, negotiating. So, it has always failed. How then can we trust these guys? That is the important thing. So, what the government needs to do, and that is where the intelligence agency needs to come into play. Okay. How did this guy individually join Boko Haram? Were they coerced into joining, or they joined out of their position? What was their level of culpability? Those are the things that the government will do by now. But while they are in the custody of the government, the government to make sure they are entitled to basic amenities of life. It is not the government doing it. It is the general standard of rule of engagement in any one situation. And it changes the government. Well, well Dixon the here seems to disagree with you when you say that they're entitled to, you know, the basic means or amenities, I mean, the means of livelihood. So uh, he's, a, sol he's, he's now, a soldier. He's a soldier. He used to be a soldier, so he can tell us from a soldier's perspective. But, of course, you have a right to your opinion, and this is, this is what you strongly believe in. But, Dixon... There are different mechanisms uh, in, uh, in uh, curtailing with uh, rule of engagement, uh, like you actually said. Uh, but for me, I don't think rule of engagement simply means when your enemy surrenders, uh, you pick him up, uh, give him a bath, and uh, house him. Uh, that is wrong and erroneous. Uh, for us to get the clarity about rule of engagement, uh, we first of all need to look at the causative factors. What led to this war? What are the causational factors, causative factors that led to this war? Is it an ideological driven war? Uh, is it that uh, the federal government you know, deprived these people of their rights? Is it that the federal government deprived them of their natural resources, their oil, or whatever the case may be? But these are guys that pick up arms and uh, uh, you know, stage an insurrection against the Nigerian state, kill a lot of human beings, kill a lot of soldiers, kill a lot of people. Okay, uh, we cannot end this war by military might, and anywhere in the world, military might cannot end uh, terrorism. Uh, but what I've advised the government to do, uh, if you are looking at DDR, demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration, reintegration is the last resort, you know, uh, in bringing these guys back to the society. You can't just pick them up, shower them, give them house, and uh, reintegrate them, or sometimes maybe send them abroad, or whatever the case may be. If you do that, like I already said, you are satisfied in criminality and you are not going to you know eliminate the causative factors that led to this war so we must eliminate this causative factor so that in the next five ten years another group of people will not raise an insurrection against the nigerian states now these guys that are surrendering what should the government do to these guys first of all they demobilize disarm these guys that disarmament then they demobilize these guys take them off from the from the battlefield or by surrendering or forcefully uh, capturing them then if you want to carry out a reintegration process they must be punished for their crime they must go through punishment even if the government says okay guys uh, we are going to give you guys amnesty but definitely you guys are definitely going to pay for this crime. Two years imprisonment, three years imprisonment. If you don't do that, if the government think they want to reintegrate these guys, because listen to me, Mary Ann, we must be very careful. We are talking about the Nigerian state. And these criminal elements are a group of people, pockets of enemies, staging war against the army, navy, air force. But, but that, let's not forget that there are people who have been coerced to also join that fight. I hope you know. There are certain young men and, and young women um, who became bombers, who became... Um, members of their sleeper cell who did not outrightly stand 
with them, but they were forced into it. Yeah, that's the demobilization stage. You need to okay. you know, interview these guys, what went wrong. Because in the, the, but anybody the, the, can claim that the, he, he or she was co-opted. Uh, this uh, application of psychology uh, comes, comes to play. You know, I need to look at how old you are. I need to understand how long you've been in this battlefield. Now, let us just be truth, uh, truthful to ourselves. Uh, if the government want to address uh, this war, they must be truthful to the Nigerian state. And if you want to think you want to give these guys, if you, and if you think uh, the government think they want to give these guys uh, this amnesty or whatever the case may be, they must compensate every soldier that died in the battlefield. They must compensate everyone that is injured in the battlefield. All the soldiers. My younger brother was shot in Chibok 2014 uh, when those Chibok guys were arrested. Uh, today, he's still living with his cast uh, in, in his leg. So they must compensate my younger brother for that gunshot. Because you can't compensate a criminal and leave the victim. We have to wait, uh, wait, wait, wait this, uh, uh, this incident. Then, uh, finally, the government must look at de-resourcing uh, these uh, criminal activities. Where are they getting their resources from? Because we're not even looking at de-resourcing. But, but we're paying for we're, we're, we're negotiating with these people and paying for abductions every now and again. Who's to say that we're not funding terrorism uh, uh, on the other hand? Yeah, Mary, and, and that is why uh, criminality is flourishing. You know, at the arrest of Evans, the kidnapper, that was when kidnapping took the boom. Why did kidnapping took the boom at the arrest of Evans? Simply because when Evans was arrested, the, was arrested, the Nigerian police did not manage that uh, uh, that incident. Uh, people got to know that Evans was making billions from kidnapping because the risk implication attached to kidnapping. I just drive by, see a human being walking on the street. I seize him. The risk implication is very, very slim compared to the risk implication going to the bank. When last did you hear about bank robbery? When last did you hear about uh, road, road robbery? Because people have got to uh, understand that kidnapping, the risk application to kidnapping is very slim. Risk application in the sense that your life is not intensively in danger in carrying out that criminal act. But as much as, I mean, I, 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 I really understand both of your angles, but as much as we're saying we do not want to fund terrorism, if you put yourself in the shoes of the parents of these people who have been abduct abducted or their family members, you would want to move heaven and earth to make sure that you get your family member out unhurt. Did you see the video of the children that were being bitten by the terrorists because they I, wanted... I, I, I saw that video. Exactly. And, and, and you want such kind of people to be given an amnesty? But, but again... How do you also stop the funding from going to them if you are not negotiating to give them money and get your family members out? So we're in between a rock and a hard place. Thank you very much. You see, when we talk about crime, uh, crime uh, is uh, an incident that will take to the end of time. You can't eliminate crime. But as security practice determines, you must mitigate this spate of crime to as low as reasonable acceptable. At the expense of how many deaths? You say what? At the expense of how many people dying? No, that's what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say in the essence is that you must mitigate this spate of crime. Mitigating this spate of crime in the sense that you have to put in all the security applications in place so that those who think they can commit crime and go scot-free will not have that opportunity. Criminal elements only need opportunity to okay. flourish. But our government must fix in every mechanism in place to mitigate this space of criminality in We have to go. Our, our time is up. Dikbo Olayoko is a broadcast journalist. He's a journalist. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Dikbo. And, of course, Dixon Osage is a security expert. Thank you, Dixon, for coming to the it's studio. It's a pleasure being here. All right, we'll take a short break. And when we return, the Afeni Ferrer has warned that Nigeria just might be heading for a dictatorship. We'll be right back. Stay with us.